All right, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Um, so we have three more presentations lined up for today. Um, and if we'll do the usual where we start off with the presentations and then you're welcome to stick around at the end. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask, that's perfectly fine. Incidentally, I have been uh, posting uh, the presentations just in case someone who hasn't presented yet wants to see how it looks. Um, so um, those are available to you. Um, so we have today, we have Monday, Wednesday. Remember, if you're presenting on Wednesday, it's from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. And that is an optional day if you are not presenting. I certainly invite you to come and support those who are presenting but it is optional, okay? So, um, so that's how we're doing that. So Monday is regular class, non-optional, and then Wednesday is the optional one from 3.30 to 5.30, okay? All right, so let's, um, I believe Daniela was listed as number one, and if you're ready to present, then uh, please go ahead. Can you guys see that? Yes, thank you. Okay. So I decided to do the effect of nicotine on brain function and memory. Um, so a lot of research has been done about how tobacco affects the body and how nicotine affects the body, mostly looking at the lungs and you know, cancer and COPD and things like that. Not a lot of research has been done on nicotine alone with the current rise of e-cigarette use, especially in high school students and college students, this is kind of an important topic that people really haven't been talking about. Most of the research is, is done with, in conjunction with tobacco, not just nicotine alone. So I, my hypothesis was that college students that use nicotine daily will show a decrease in cognitive function and memory. So for my study, I took a group of 100 participants from Westchester University. I looked at four different classes of 25 students, making sure to range from different classes to you know, get a wide variety of students. Um, I looked at their age, their preferred gender, educational year, any pre-existing conditions that they had to make sure there wasn't any brain injury apparent or any concussions that were recent to try to mitigate any 
uh, changes that that would cause. And also I looked at their nicotine usage. So for my materials, I made three questionnaires. One was a questionnaire specifically for this project to make sure that I didn't miss any important information. Um, I used the Bender Visual Motor Gestalt test and also a cognitive reflection test. And I also gave out the consent form. Um, I measured the amount of nicotine use, cognitive function, and memory. So this was a between, between groups correlational study. I was looking at the uh, correlation between nicotine usage and their cognitive function, if it decreased or increased. Um, my independent variable was nicotine usage. My dependent variable was cognitive ability score. So for my procedure, the participants were asked to fill out the form. This would um, indicate their age, their nicotine usage, their educational year, their preferred gender, and the pre-existing pre conditions as I said before. The second test would be Bender Gestalt test, which measures um, their memory. Uh, this would be a series of cards that participants will look at, and then they would have to redraw on their own piece of paper in a certain amount of time. They were also going to be given a cognitive reflection test. And this was a series of three questions that seem pretty easy in first thought, but actually are pretty complex and require some thought to them. So this is going to be testing their cognitive ability. So these are my results. Um, for my participants, 30% of the people that I looked at used nicotine daily. 35% um, were rarely and 34% never. So for my scores, I only got one of my uh, cognitive testing scores. We looked at the cognitive test, not the memory part of this. Um, so for my range, they scored anywhere from six to 28 with an average score of 15. And you can see for my daily scores, for my daily nicotine users, they scored a 13.85, for rare 14.3, and for none 17.6. So you can see that without nicotine, they scored highly. And with nicotine, they scored a little bit lower. So you can see from the results that my study showed that nicotine did have a significant effect on the cognitive ability of the participants. Um, this is pretty important because there is an increased usage of nicotine. You know, we're seeing that high school students are even using it, even middle school students are starting to use it. So it's pretty important that we learn how this is affecting the people that are using it. So my strength was my sample size. I had a pretty decent size, about 100 students. Um, I could do a higher and that would be more applicable to the population. But I think 100 is pretty good for now. My limitation is the use of questionnaires. I think that kind of caused a little bit of an issue because there could be some, um, what am I looking for? There could be some confusion with the participants filling out the questionnaire on their own. Any questions? Thank you, very nice presentation. Um, really interesting uh, results that you found there. It looks like things were significant. Um, were you able to figure out which groups were different from each other? Yeah, so, um, what was it? I have that, I don't think I put it in my slides. No, that's fine. But I have it in my paper. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. I was just curious what you found, but that's okay. Um, I'll look forward to reading it later then. Um, well, again, very nice presentation, thank you. Um, and let's turn it over to Garrett, who I believe is next. All right, so um, the title of my study was Stress Relief, The Power of Tranquil Water. I'll start this up real quick. All right, so the topic was how recreating near a body of water affects cognition, cognitive levels, or cortisol levels, sorry about that. Um, the significance is that everyone undergoes various amounts of stress throughout their life, but not everybody handles it um, in a healthy way. Uh, past research looks at how recreating in nature in general affects stress level, but this is the first study that examines how spending time near water, specifically decreases the stress hormone cortisol. 
for my hypothesis, I wrote uh, individuals spending at least 140 minutes per week near a body of water will produce less of the stress hormone cortisol than those spending zero minutes per week. For my participants, there were 74 college students ages 18 to 24. Um, 37 were males, 37 were females. Uh, within the water group, uh, there are 44, th 34 participants. In the non-water group, there are 40 participants. And the participants were randomly assigned to groups using random number generator. For my materials, there were two questionnaires. One was a perceived stress scale, which measured stress level, and then a demographics questionnaire. Uh, there was also cortisol saliva test kits used to test participants' cortisol levels throughout the study. This was a between participants experimental study because the independent variable could be manipulated. Um, independent independent variable was spending the 140 minutes per week near a body of water in which one group spent 20 minutes per day for seven days and one group spent zero minutes. The dependent variable was the average cortisol level over the seven days. So the procedure uh, for the water group, all participants were instructed to recreate near the same body of water for 20 minutes per day for the seven days. Uh, they, were, they were prohibited from exercising during the recreation time. Uh, this helped control for extraneous variable of exercise that is known to have a stress relieving effect. The non-water group was instructed to stay away from any body of water for the seven days. And all participants were instructed to uh, test their cortisol levels once in the morning, once at noon, once in the evening, and then once at night. Uh, so the results, there are 50% males, 50% female. The academic years range from freshmen to seniors with 17% freshmen, 29% sophomores, 24% juniors, and 28% seniors. The variables amongst participants, 45.9% were in the water group, 54.9%. 1% were in the non-water group. And the dependent variable ranged from five micrograms per deciliter and 21, point, 21 micrograms per deciliter for cortisol level with a mean of 13.18 and a standard deviation of 4.64. So the data was analyzed using the independent samples t-test with time spent near the water as the independent variable and cortisol level as a dependent variable. Uh, the quarter, there was also an alpha of 0.05 used for all statistical tests. The cortisol level for the water group had a mean of 11.85 micrograms per deciliter with a standard deviation of 4.65. And the cortisol level for the non-water group had a mean of 14.3 micrograms per deciliter with a standard deviation of 4.39. The p-value was 0.0115, which showed statistical significance. Um, the data shows that the group that spent the 140 minutes per week near the body of water did have lower cortisol levels than the group spending zero minutes near the water. And this supported my hypothesis. So the importance of the study was to show one simple option of a healthy way to relieve stress. Uh, the main strength is that it used concrete data to measure stress level, which is the amount of cortisol, rather than relying on self-report data like questionnaires. Uh, the main weakness was the cost of the cortisol test. Uh, each cortisol saliva test kit is about $50, meaning a week's worth of cortisol kits for one participant would be like $1,400. Um, another weakness was the limited diversity within participants, as well as the limited diversity within the setting. There's also no control for other extraneous variables, including the various amounts of stress the participants were under, such as academic, social, and family stress. And then for future uh, replication of the study, I'm having a larger sample size 
with diversity of demographics along with um, variety of settings, such as different bodies of water. Um, I would also try to reduce the cost of the cortisol testing to make it more affordable study. And that's it. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I love the idea that you decided to do a, a cortisol because you did have unlimited resources. So um, I think that that made it kind of really interesting, just the different perspective um, than a lot of self-report tests, which is perfectly fine too. We rely on those, um, but I enjoyed that. Um, remind us, it was more than one daily test, right? That's, be, that's why it was so expensive. How, remind us like how you, the cortisol procedure exactly worked. Yeah, so the participants were, um, they were gonna test their cortisol through the saliva samples in the morning, at noon, in the evening, and at night, just to see if there was like any difference between the levels before or after they spent time near water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was that was cool too. And then we looked at averages. Um, but yeah, very nice study. Um, okay, well, thank you. Um, and I believe we have one more presentation today, and I believe that that is Jasmine. Um, so for my study, I decided to examine the relationship between an adult's living situation and their autonomy. It has been found that the individual characteristics that young Americans conceptualize as marking their transition into adulthood are accepting responsibility for oneself, making independent decisions, and um, having financial independence for themselves. The development of these characteristics come with life changes that are experienced during the transition from adolescence to adulthood, such as entering the workforce, going away for college, and moving out of your parents' house. Previous research has shown that age and living with your parents is positively associated with self-reliance during adulthood and Slovenian emerging adults. And models of individuation that were examined in the study, it showed growing autonomous behavior that related to their connectedness to their parents during young adulthood. The, this study represents the culture and traditions in Slovenia. And it's important to note that cultures and traditions and practices may vary across cultures and global regions. In a study conducted in the United States, it examined the influence of a parent-child relationship and its, and its effects on autonomous behavior in young adults with type one diabetes. This study was important because the transition from adolescence to adulthood, to young adulthood, and people with diabetes is a crucial period of time because they become more responsible when caring for their health. The goal of my study was to examine the development of autonomy as it pertains to American adults without focusing on any underlying health conditions that my participants may have. It is to be predicted that young adults who do not live with their parents whether it be on a college campus or off campus, but without their parents or other family members, will be perceived as more autonomous because they are not affected by the direct influence and direction of their parents. My study consisted of 84 Westchester University students who will represent the population of students on Westchester University's campus. The participants fell specifically between the ages of 18 and 25 years old and they were given a compensation of a $10 gift card to the Westchester University campus store for participating in my study. They were assigned to three separate groups based on their living situation. And the demographics recorded were age, gender, and grade level classification. Participants filled out in an, inform, an informed consent form as well as a short questionnaire that collected their information on their living situation and survey the demographics of the group. Participants also filled out the perceived parental autonomy scale or the PPAS scale. I also included an example of what the PPAS scale looks like to the right of this slide. For this study, a modified version of the PPAS was used to identify the participants' perceptions of their parents as it relates to their own personal autonomy without excluding any participants who may not belong to the traditional American family where there are two parents in a household. The PPAS asked parents 
ask participants to rate statements given to them on a scale of one to seven, one meaning that they did not agree with the statement at all, and seven meaning that they strongly agree. These statements measure perception of their parents as it applied to their current relationship with them. This was a correlational study with natural manipulation in a between subjects design. The levels of independent variables consisted of three categories based on the participants living situation. These levels were living on campus, living off campus with parents or other family members and living off campus but without parents or other family members. And the dependent variable in my study was the variation of autonomy levels across the three different variable groups. The data collected in my study showed that about 55% of participants were females while 45% of the participants were male. There were about 27% of participants who were freshmen, 27% who were sophomores, 21% that were juniors and 25% that were seniors. The minimum age limit for participants in my study was 18 years old and the maximum age limit was 25 years old while the average age of participants in my study was 21.6 years old. The data, the data also showed that about 30% of participants lived on campus while 33% lived off campus but with family members and 37% lived off campus but without family members. After running an ANOVA analysis test on SPSS, the data showed that there was a statistically significant difference in autonomy levels between participants who lived on campus and those that lived off campus but without family members with a p-value of 0.02 and it also showed that there was a statistically significant difference in autonomy levels between participants that lived off campus with their family members and those that lived off campus and without their family members with a p-value of 0 0.01. There was no significant difference in autonomy levels between participants that lived on campus and those that lived off campus but without family members with a p-value of 0 0.20. My hypothesis that participants who did not live with their parents, whether it be on campus or off campus, but without parents or other family members will be perceived as more autonomous is supported by the data collected in my study. Any questions? All right, thank you, very interesting. Um, I really liked actually how you went ahead and paired up your discussion of the results with some of the output from the results. I thought that was very clever. Um, so thank you for doing that. Um, um, a quick question. So, so what does this mean? Um, what's, what's the big picture answer here then? What should we do? Um, I think that this was to like encourage like young adults to make the decision to live on campus or live independently after they um, graduate high school because they can learn like valuable life lessons and become independent and experience the real world during a crucial period of time for them. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, I agree. Um, yeah, perfect. Okay, so that is the end of our presentations for today. Um, if you let me show you now oh jasmine if you could stop sharing so i can share my um yeah i don't know how to do that Sorry. there should be a uh uh something at the bottom where you're sharing your screen where you can uh i can stop you from sharing is that okay because okay? i okay. can't find it okay okay and uh let me go ahead and i want to share this Okay, so your attendance code for today is 3813. Again, that's 3813. Um, that's all I have for you guys today. You are welcome to hang back if you have any questions. Otherwise, have a wonderful weekend and I'll see you on Monday. All right, so if you're sticking around, I don't know if you're still just doing your D2L thing, which is perfectly fine, or if you have some questions. If you do, there's still a few of us left, so if you wouldn't mind chatting them in, 
um, that would be super. Ashley, it's just you and me. Any questions? All right, well, I'll hang back for just another minute. And if nothing comes through, I'm gonna go ahead and end the meeting and you're always welcome to email me if you have any questions, okay? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end this meeting now. Um, hopefully you have the attendance code you need. And if you have any questions, you can email me. Okay, have a great weekend.